Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, we have a great guest on today. His name is Adam with FBUC on Apologetics. He was an agnostic. From an agnostic, he became a born-again Christian. But in his time of being a born-again Christian, he developed unforgiveness and bitterness. In that time, Jesus led him to an area that showed him himself on the edge of hell. Adam, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor. Adam, could you just tell us about your childhood and how you were raised, first of all? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was actually uh, an agnostic. If you would have asked me what my belief system was, I would have told you that I was maybe agnostic or maybe even atheist. Um, and it's really interesting because I knew God existed. Uh, I knew that Jesus was Lord. And it's interesting because in Romans 1, it talks about how men suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. If you think about like a beach ball that you're trying to hold underwater, uh, that's, that's kind of like the picture. You're actively suppressing the truth. So, I mean, there were times where even God spoke to me since I was younger, uh, but God kind of handed me over to this uh, deception, this reprobate mind, if you will. And, uh, and even though I knew that he existed and that he had spoken to me since my childhood, I just, I suppressed the truth because I didn't want him to be real, I guess. I, I didn't want to follow him and give my life to him. I wanted to continue in my sin. Um, so, but it's weird because like I said, when I was younger, God would speak to me. And one example was uh, when I was in my teens, I was driving very recklessly and I didn't have my seatbelt on. And God told me, you need to put your seatbelt on. And I was like, yeah, is, is that really God? And do I really need to do this? And he said, you need to put your seatbelt on. And within probably 10 seconds down the road, I had a horrific wreck. Uh, I flipped my car. It looked like a crushed tin can. I mean, it was awful. It, the, the people that came and looked at it couldn't believe that, that I survived. And the strange thing is there was not a single bruise on me, a single cut, nothing. And since I flipped upside down, there's no doubt that I would have you know, broken my neck or had horrific injuries. But because God told me right before that uh, to put my seatbelt on, not a thing happened. And I wondered after that, I wondered, why didn't God just tell me to avoid that accident altogether, you know, to be careful coming around that corner. But looking back on it, that changed the entire trajectory, trajectory of my entire life. Uh, that was actually what helped me decide to go into the military, uh, went into the military, and there's where I met my wife who ended up leading me to Christ down the road. Um, and so we, we were together, but she was a backslidden Christian. And so she wasn't, she wasn't really serious about it, but she got to the point where she was like, you know what, if I'm going to marry you, I, I want to marry a Christian. And since I wasn't a Christian, she broke up with me and it was a really hard time in my life, but uh, it, it, it was all for our good because um, what happened was it, part of the agreement for us to get back together was, for me to get into church. And I said, okay, fine. So I'll start going to church with, you know, and I, I was not particularly looking forward to it. I was like, okay, fine. If that's what it takes, I'll, I'll go to church. And uh, so I started going to church and over the next nine months or so, uh, God really began to work on me. He, he really began to use the pastor. The pastor was preaching uh, against sin and it was just really convicting me and letting me know that I had strayed from God and that I was not uh, living right before God. But, you know, stubborn and as hard hearted as I had become, you know, like, like I said, like, I'd suppressed the truth and unrighteousness, I, I became very hardened. It, it took a lot for God to break through to me. And, uh, and he, he ended up having to show me so many different kinds of miracles, because, I, you know, I was so hardened. But I remember telling him, I remember making this, I guess, deal with him, so to speak. I said, if you can show me, beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're real, then I will follow you with my entire heart. I'll, I'll follow you 110%. I'll be all in. But, but you have to show me 110% that, that you exist, you're real. And surprisingly, in his mercy, he took me up on that. And he began to show me just amazing signs and, and miracles and wonders uh, over that time. And um, like for, for one example, I was driving down the road and I was like praying. I was like, God, can you show me a sign? And 
he said, okay, what would you like me to show you? And I said, okay. So I thought in my mind, this has got to be something that is so outlandish, so out there, so wild that it would have to be God. Like there would be no doubting it whatsoever. And, and I thought in my mind, I was like, what could I think of that would just be so crazy? And I thought, okay, pigs fly. I, I want to see, I want to see pigs fly. And he actually told me, okay. And within probably 20 seconds, I was driving down the road and, um, and I saw this billboard with this huge flying pig, this pig with wings above it. And on the billboard, it said something to the effect of when pigs fly. And I mean, this was like right after I had prayed this and I was just like, wow. I mean, I mean, I'd love to say that right then that night I went home and I, I got on my face and confessed my sins and turned my life over right then. But it, it didn't happen right then. I was still so stubborn hearted and so just hard hearted that God had to keep showing me miracles like this. But eventually he wore me down where it was like, OK, there's there's no denying it. There's absolutely no denying it. Jesus is, is alive. He's real. And, and I can't deny it anymore. Even though like I tried, I, I tried suppressing the truth for so long, but I was like, I, I can't deny it. So I, I have to be all in. And I just, in my bed, I just confessed. I said, Jesus is Lord. And, and I did that three times, not to say that every single person out there has to do it three times, but I did. And as soon as I did it, there was the Holy Spirit came into me and everything changed. I mean, it, it was a very, I had a very powerful uh, born again experience. I mean, uh, I had this love and this peace just flood my heart. Um, sins began to just uh, shed off of me one by one. I, I wanted to evangelize and share the gospel with as many people as I could. Um, I mean, I just want to tell everybody I was on fire for the Lord and even the next day, it was like the grass looked greener. It was just, uh, I mean, everything was different. But, um, but what I noticed was the church that I was in, which actually had pretty solid doctrine, uh, by, by most standards, at least uh, within the community, they, they were seen as, as a church that had pretty solid doctrine. And they were kind of like the church in Sardis. They were, they were like, they were viewed by everybody as the church that was alive, right? But in reality, uh, they were they were dead on the inside. And um, but what I noticed was when I had this amazing transformation, this born again experience, you know, I was even seeing miracles and just so many uh, miracles just started flowing out from that and signs. But I noticed that everybody else around me wasn't really feeling the same way and seeing the same things. And they weren't as on fire. And they, they even kind of talked to me like, oh, that's just the honeymoon phase. You know, it'll it'll kind of fizzle out. Uh, that's only just the beginning. And I thought, you know, I, I think now I think how sad is that? Because we're commanded in the Bible to be zealous. Uh, Jesus says in Revelation uh, the, to the Laodiceans to be zealous and repent or he's going to spew them out of their mouth, out of his mouth. So this is a command to be zealous. It's not optional. Adam, explain your life as an agnostic, because what made you believe that you didn't know that God exists? What was it that made you question if God existed or not? Because I know agnostic means you just don't know, as opposed to atheist, where you just don't believe in God. So what was it that made you think, okay, I'm not sure that God exists? He may or he may not. What was it? I think I just suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. Um, You know, I even though I knew there was a God, it was more like I didn't want there to be. So I was kind of handed over to this deception. Uh, I was kind of trying to push him out and pretend like he, he didn't exist. And I ended up falling into this deception. And I think it was just as simple as I just wanted to continue my life of sin. And, uh, and just like, just like I said, in Romans one, men suppress the truth and unrighteousness because of their unrighteousness they suppress the truth. And that's what I was doing. Even though I knew, I knew that God was very much alive and he was real, but I just, I I didn't want to know, I guess. So Adam, I know that you mentioned how, when you began to go to church, people in the church didn't seem like they were living the life or they didn't believe a lot of the things that they spoke on. And it kind of made you bitter and resentful. Could you just elaborate on that? Well, yeah. So, uh, so 
what happened was I kind of started to fall away into sin. Um, and the church had pretty solid doctrine uh, for the most part, at least everybody would have said so. So they, they did preach against sin, but when you were in small groups and when you were talking to other people in the church, sin was kind of downplayed or, you know, as long as, Hey, you're already saved. So it's not really that big of a deal. It was kind of that mentality. And so I started falling into major unforgiveness and I started to, uh, hate started to fill my heart. And, uh, it's just like it says in James that desire, uh, when it conceives, it gives birth to sin and then sin, when it's fully grown, it, it brings forth death. And that's what was going on with me. I, I started, this started uh, taking hold of me. It was this root of bitterness that started taking hold. And, and I was running from God, even though I had this powerful born again experience, I started uh, veering off and running from God. And God, what happened was um, I actually got to the point where I was just getting super filled with just anger and bitterness. And I remember I was, I was just venting to my wife about how these people had hurt me and what they, what they did to me. And I was just going off and all of a sudden, um, God interrupted my venting and literally just yelled in my head. Like he just, he yelled and spoke to me and said, that's enough. Stop it. And, you know, a lot of people will say that God speaks in a still small voice. And yes, that's true. Uh, most of the time, but this time God yelled. And the best way I can describe it was, um, you know, imagine like a child about to go out into the road and a father just yells to get the child to, you know, out of the road. That's what it was like. I mean, God just yelled and said, that's enough. Stop it. And unfortunately, I didn't heed that warning. Uh, it, it took me back for a second because it actually echoed in my head. It was that loud. And it took me back for a second. But unfortunately, I just doubled down and I just went back into the venting and the, and the, just the anger and the bitterness. And, um, during this time, God was showing me that, that I was running from him and, and he, he, he stopped speaking to me. I, I know the exact second that the Holy spirit left me. It was right then I lost peace. I lost joy. I lost the fellowship of the Holy spirit. He wasn't speaking to me. Uh, and if, if, well, if he did, it was only to tell me very harsh things. Like he told me, out of Luke, that if anyone puts their hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. I, I got so mad. I remember getting mad at God. Like, how dare you tell me this? How dare you tell me that I'm not fit for the kingdom of God? And, you know, after I'd had this amazing born again experience and, you know, you can tell me this, but he was just speaking what, what I felt like very harsh things at the time, but it was to bring me back. Um, but like I said, what I noticed about the church was they they, a lot of them, a lot of them knew what was going on with me. And they knew that I had this unforgiveness, even leaders in the church. I was even going to counseling. Uh, one of the pastors there was, was counseling us. And um, nobody ever warned me that this unforgiveness could lead me to hell. I mean, you know, Jesus says in Matthew six, that if you don't forgive your brother, then neither will your heavenly father forgive you. But nobody, nobody told me that it was kind of just like this, I mean, in the sermons, they preached against sin, but it was kind of like this, uh, you know, hey, God will work it out. I mean, you know, hey, just just hang in there, just pray about it. But there was no urgency to get out of this sin or anything like that. And, and, and that that kind of um, when I finally came out of it, that made me really uh, almost like a righteous anger that nobody warned me. Nobody cared about me enough. Uh, and loved me enough to warn me. And I remember even going to church, believe it or not, I know this sounds crazy, but I remember going to church and I knew what I was doing was wrong, but I remember going to church and praying that somebody with the gift of prophecy or something would, would come up to me and say, hey, I know that you're in sin and would rebuke me. I mean, I would actually pray for someone to come up and do that, but um, no, nobody warned me, even those who knew my situation. But why do you think that no one said anything? Do you think that they just believe that whatever you're fine, just because you're saved, whatever, you can just do whatever you want. You can have this unforgiveness in your heart and um, you'll be fine. And like you said, God will just work it out. Why do you think they thought this way? Yeah, I mean, the pastor never really spoke too much about eternal security, but it was very much in the church culture. 
like as far as, you know, in the counseling and, and in the small groups and just how people talked, uh, I was like, Hey, you know, as long as you're truly saved, then, you know, I mean, God will just work it out. It'll, it'll be okay. Um, there just wasn't this, this, uh, zealousness against sin. It was, it was just kind of, uh, downplayed. And the thing is, this was a, like I said, this was a church that was regarded very highly among other, other Christians and other churches in the city. This was, uh, this wasn't like, you know, free grace or anything like that. This was, uh, for most, most standards, it, this would be considered a biblical solid church, but, uh, but they just, it, it was the church culture that this once they'd always saved took over. And it was, it, it just caused people, I believe, to become, uh, lax with sin. And it, it just, it just wasn't on the, uh, the front burner. So now from there, you're falling into sin, the sin of unforgiveness, and you're going deeper and deeper and no one is helping you. What happened? Because I remember you mentioned saying that you heard a preacher say something. What did this preacher say that helped change your life? Yeah. So, you know, like you said, I, it just kept getting worse and worse. And there were actual demons. I mean, that's the only way to describe it is that I began to be filled with demons. Um, I mean, because I, I started having major blasphemous thoughts. And this, like I said, I had a powerful born again experience. I, I love Jesus, but it was like these, these thoughts started coming in. I started getting these mystery illnesses that just started coming and it, it got worse and worse. Like it got to the point I was almost getting diagnosed with a new mystery illness that the doctors couldn't figure out. It seemed like every couple of weeks and uh, like one of them was my heart was just began fluttering and they couldn't figure it out. They did an EKG on me. They ran tests. They said, well, I mean, there's nothing that that seems to be wrong. And they were about to put me on meds and this sort of thing. Um, and, and that's something right there, too, to think about for those of you out there. If, if you're ever having a an illness that mm -hmm. the doctors can't find, there's there's a chance that that could be demons. Uh, I mean, I know it was for me, but it just got worse and worse. And I just was handed over more and more to this anger and bitterness. And it got to the point that I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I remember somebody telling me that, that they locked themselves in a room for 45 minutes and said, you know, I'm not coming out of this room until I get right with God. But I knew that, okay, that's what I needed to do. I, that's exactly what I need to do. So I locked myself in a room and I said, I'm not coming out of this room until until I figure out what's wrong, until I get right with God. And, and I locked myself in there. This was probably about 45 minutes or so. And I was just crying out to God. And he finally showed up in a vision and my eyes were open. I wasn't sleeping or anything like that, but he showed up and he grabbed my arms in this vision and dangled me over a cliff. And it was, this cliff was probably a hundred or so feet high. And down below was a lake of fire. And this lake of fire seemed to go on infinitely. It just kept going as far as you could see. And he told me, he, he dangling me off this cliff, he told me that I had a choice to make, that I had to choose either him or the world. And, and I knew, you know, sometimes when God speaks to you, even though he doesn't say the actual words, you, you kind of just know uh, other things about it. Like it's kind of just impressed upon you, like maybe a word of knowledge. So, you know, like if you have a word of knowledge, it's something that's just impressed upon you and you don't really know how you know it, but you just know it. And God, God told me that, or I had this sense that whatever choice I made, that if I chose to go with the world over him, that he would permanently hand me over to reprobate mind. I, I knew that that would be, that was the sense that I got that this was going to be a permanent uh, decision that I had to choose right then who, who I wanted to serve, uh, the world or him. And I was so filled with anger and, and just demons and bitterness that I remember I, I came so close to choosing the world. And, and it just, it scares me to this day, how close I was. I mean, I, it, it could have gone either way. It, it was that close. I almost uttered the words. I, I was right on the brink of uttering the words. So what was and, it that made you say, okay, maybe I'll choose the world instead of Jesus? What was it? I, I was just, I, I think I just had this hatred. I, I just had this hatred towards God. And, uh, and, and that's what it says in John three. It says that men, men don't come to the light because they, they hate the light. Um, 
they hate, they hate Jesus. That's what it really comes down to. And if you're, if you're walking in sin, according to John three, it, it says that you actually don't love Jesus. Okay. To, to love him is to keep his commands. And, and I was just willfully in rebellion against him just over and over. And he was trying to draw me back, but I, I kept, you know, just, just refusing that. And, uh, and he just handed me over to this. And, um, but so I almost chose the world, but just at the last second, I ended up choosing him. And I said, okay, I choose you. And he pulled me back up over the cliff. And he said, well, then actually obey me then. He said, actually obey me. And I knew right then that I actually had to start doing things to be obedient to him and actually start doing what he, what he told me to do. You know, he, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but yet you don't do the things that I tell you. And, and that, was, that was totally me. I, I'd become a Pharisee. Uh, you know, I had all this wickedness and, and bitterness and, and envy and all this stuff in my heart. But, uh, but I was professing God and I, I would have told you at the time that I was a Christian and, but really inside my heart had become, had become hardened and, and wicked. And so he said, okay, you actually need to obey me. And I repented of everything. I repented of all the unforgiveness. And I said, okay, I'm going to do things your way from now on. Lord. And so, uh, at that moment, it was like everything just shed off of me. All the mystery illnesses went away. I mean, instantly I had, I had several illnesses that they couldn't figure out that just were gone. Um, I was filled with the peace and joy and love of the Holy spirit. Again, uh, he immediately began to speak to me again. I mean, everything was restored. I was put on fire for the Lord. And I mean, I mean like almost literally on fire because my skin was even hot to the touch. What I mean by that is you, like my wife could, could feel my, my hand and it would be hot. All my skin all around was hot. So we even took my temperature and my temperature was normal. It was like, you know, whatever, 98, 99, whatever it was. And it was normal, but my, my skin felt like it was like 103. And this went on for three days. And I think that was just like a sign of, of God saying, okay, now you're back on fire again. You know, like the Laodicean church, he, he tells them to be zealous and repent. Um, well, I'd become lukewarm or probably cold and I'd repent and he put me back on fire again. And I, I, I was excited to witness again. I, I was excited to, to share the gospel with the lost again and just tell everybody I knew just like I was at first. Um, so, but yeah. So when Jesus brought you to this cliff, what was the cliff? Was it hell? What was it? Yeah, I, I guess it was hell. It was the lake of fire. Uh, it just, like I said, it just went on for, it seemed like forever. And uh, I, I mean, it, it was fire. It just looked like a lake of fire. Wow. Now at this time, were you a born again Christian? Oh yes. Uh, I mean, like I said, I, and for those of you that may doubt, well, okay, you, you weren't really born again. It was like, okay, by every measure. I mean, even people in the church were looking at me like, okay, you need to slow down. This is a little too much. I mean, I was getting involved in everything with church. I was excited. I was telling everybody I knew that, Hey, Jesus is alive. Like, like this is, this is real. Jesus is real. And I, I was so excited. I was seeing miracles. God was speaking to me like very, very intimately. Um, and, and I mean, for anybody who would say that I wasn't born again, I mean, like I said, it, it was a complete 180. Uh, sins were just stripping off and just, I, I was just starting to, like my mouth started changing. I stopped cursing. I stopped all these sins. And it was just like God. And I remember uh, I asked God, I, I said, will it always be this easy? Because it just seemed it just seemed easy. It just seemed to flow in the beginning. And I asked him, I said, will it always be this easy? And he showed me this vision of, of me kind of just gliding through a house and in, in hallways and in rooms. And he was just kind of, he had his hand on my back and was just kind of pushing me through. And I was just gliding through. And he said, yes, as long as you don't reach out and grab onto anything in this world. And that's, that's what I ended up doing. That's why he told me, to choose him or the world, because what I did was I, I reached out and I grabbed on to, uh, grabbed on to the things of this, this world, you know, my own, my own, uh, dignity. And, you know, I thought my own sense of, of justice and all this that I was trying to, when they hurt me, that I was trying to grab onto. Um, so yeah, but, but like I said, the, the people in the church, they, they never, 
really warned me. They, they never warned me, even when I was going to counseling, they never told me that, hey, this is dangerous to have this hatred in your heart. You know, in First John, it says that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And we know that murderers don't have eternal life abiding in them. But I had major unforgiveness, major hate, and, uh, and but nobody told me. And so that's that's part of why I wanted to share my testimony and part of why uh, I started this channel because I asked God for, you know, I, I just wanted to, to share what I'd found out and to warn other people that yes, this absolutely can happen. And because nobody warned me, I wanted to warn others out there who might be going through the same thing. So Adam, unforgiveness is such a major issue right now, I believe. And it's probably been like this forever, major issue forever, but it's so much unforgiveness harboring in so many people's hearts and even Christians, does unforgiveness send one to hell, even if one is born again at the time? Because I know how the Lord says, um, if you do not forgive, I cannot forgive you. So what do you say about that? Can a person, because you, it sounds like you almost lost your salvation because of the bitterness and hate, as you say, and forgiveness was in your heart. So would you say that having an unforgiving heart send one to hell. Well, yeah. And the reason I believe that is because Jesus himself says so. Uh, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Just, just look at this verse. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, for if you do not, for if you forgive others, their trespasses, your heavenly father. So this is talking to Christians, your father, your, your heavenly father, Christians will also forgive you. But if you, Christian, okay, he's talking about those who, whose father is, is God. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. This to me is, is unbelievably plain. And, and these are one of the discrepancies that I began to see in the church that this is one of the first things, actually. Um, when I looked around and nobody else around me seemed to believe in eternal security. And I was like, but the Holy Spirit was telling me that no, this is not a true doctrine. And I remember I came across this verse and I was like, well, that seems pretty clear. I mean, if we as a Christian don't forgive, then we won't be forgiven. If we don't have forgiveness, then that means that we can't enter uh, the kingdom of God and we can't enter heaven. Um, so, but I actually brought this to my pastor or I just brought my concerns. And again, he was just reassuring me, no, no, a true believer can't lose your salvation. So I guess I guess passages like this, uh, they would just believe that it doesn't apply to them or that you would just naturally forgive. But like in my case, I did not want to naturally forgive. It, it, it did not come easy. It was very, very difficult. That basically goes against the once saved, always saved belief system. Now, you said that you know the origin or you found the origin of where once saved, always saved came from. Uh, could you tell us the origin you found and also did the early Christians believe once saved, always saved? Yeah, so for the first, really the first uh, 1500 years, eternal security was not believed by the church. Um, eternal security was not believed by the Jews. Uh, if you just read the Old Testament, you would never come to the conclusion that, uh, that you know, they would have believed in eternal security. Uh, in fact, we have verses like Ezekiel 18. Just, just listen to this. You, you listen to this and tell me if this sounds like the Jews at the time would have been thinking in their minds, eternal security. Okay, Ezekiel 18, it says, but when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness, okay, so this is a saved person, a righteous person, turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? And this is talking about your soul, shall your soul live? Because in context, he says the soul that sins shall die, Okay says, none of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and, and the sin he has committed for them, he shall die. Yet you say the way the Lord is not just here now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? And um, so they, they would not have believed eternal security. There's no record of the Jews believing eternal security. There's no record of anyone in the first 1500 years believing in eternal security, there's a saying that if it's new, it's not true, right? Well, for the first 1500 years, nobody believed this. Now, some people will point to 
Augustine and say, well, Augustine believed in eternal security. Well, that's only partially true. Augustine believed in a form of it. He believed in it so much as he believed certain people were gifted with the gift of uh, perseverance. So he, he basically believed that only certain people were given this gift. So certain people couldn't fall away, but he absolutely believed that most people could, that most people didn't have this gift. And he believed that you could lose your salvation. So even he didn't believe it. And Augustine was, was uh, you know, in the 300s in the fourth century. But, uh, but it wasn't until Martin Luther and Calvin came along in the 1500s and promoted this doctrine uh, that it really, it really became a thing because the Catholic Church didn't believe this. For the first 1500 years of Christianity, the early Christians didn't believe this. The Catholic Church didn't believe this. The early Christians in the first several hundred years of Christianity, if you go back and read their writings, they are very, very clear. So the early Christians did not believe in eternal security. The Catholic Church didn't believe in eternal security. Um, if you just would have read some of their writings, you would see that they absolutely did not believe eternal security. They believed that you could have true faith and then fall away and not be saved anymore. Um, so you can, you can go. There's, there's actually a video that I did where I interviewed Chip Ludic and we discussed this, what the early Christians believed on this. So um, please check that out. I have that in my channel under interviews. Uh, but so if nobody believed this, if the Jews didn't believe this, if the Catholic Church for the first 1500 years didn't believe this, if the anti-Nicene Christians for the first several hundred years didn't believe this, um, then, then why do we believe it today? And the answer is, it, it comes from Martin Luther and Calvin. That's really where it comes from. So it's, it's only the past 1500 or, or 500 years or so that, that this has been in the church. And if we just look at uh, John Calvin, th what they did is they kind of took Augustine's writings and kind of took them to the next level. And, uh, and said, hey, you know, we, we can wander off into sin. Martin Luther actually said, he, he's famously quoted as saying that we can, we can murder and commit adultery a thousand times in a day. And the implication was we can still be saved. He believed that, that grace covered us uh, even while we're in our sin. Um, but in Titus uh, chapter two, uh, I, th I think starting at verse 11, it talks about what the grace of God really is. It's to train us to live holy lives. It's to bring us out of sin. That's the true grace of God. So uh, Martin Luther just didn't understand the grace of God. And if we look at Calvin, um, he, th there were people that he had murdered. I mean, th these were not, Jesus said that we will know false teachers by their fruit. And fruit, I mean, we know fruit is deeds. It's not only false teaching, but it's also deeds. And John Calvin had people murdered. If you look, if you look up Michael Servetus, he had Michael Servetus murdered. He had him put to death because he disagreed with some things that, that he wrote. So when he showed up to church, he had him uh, arrested and they ended up burning him with greenwood. So it would actually burn slower. They, it, it was a very miserable death that he, he put him to death. And, um, and these are men. And there's things that also uh, Martin Luther did. And this is not the fruit of righteous men. When Jesus says, look out for false teachers, we need to be looking at their fruit and, and seeing, you know, are these, are these men, did they, they truly have good fruit because putting people to death, that's not good fruit. And then if you just look at Martin Luther's works, he, he was very much against the Jews. I mean, if you, if you just look at some of the quotes that he had against the Jews, it was very, very, very ungodly. And, uh, and actually, Hitler came along and used some of his writings uh, to, to justify himself. And he used Martin Luther to do that, to justify himself in, in the killing of the Jews. Wow, that's amazing, because Martin Luther is very praised today. Everyone knows him for the things that he has done. Now, you even told me earlier that Martin Luther wanted to get rid of a few books of the Bible. Why? And what books were they? Yeah, he wanted to put them as sort of an appendix at the end of the Bible. And uh, these included books like Hebrews, uh, Jude, Revelation, and uh, it was Hebrews, Jude, Revelation. It was one more. Uh, I can't remember. James? Right was it James? James, yes. Okay, of course, James. How could I forget James? But yes, uh, because, I mean, obviously, these would have conflicted majorly with his theology. 
because I mean, if you just look, Hebrews is one of the clearest books teaching that you can lose your salvation that we that we have. I mean, if you just look at Hebrews six, Hebrews ten, uh, it is not preaching eternal security. It says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment that will consume the adversaries. And, uh, and, and 1 John says that if, we're, that if we're friends of the world, we become an enemy of God. So this is what it's talking about. An enemy of God can be a Christian who, who goes on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth. Um, and then Hebrews 6, Hebrews 3, I mean, really just all throughout the book. It's, it's, it's warning Christians it says, holy brothers, you know, uh, don't neglect your salvation. And why? Well, he goes on to give the analogy of the, of the Israelites who turned away from God after they were rescued out of Egypt. And he says, don't harden your hearts like they did in the rebellion. So it's really just all throughout. And then of course he, James, because James, uh, you know, I mean, it's the same with James, um, that strictly went against his theology and then also Jude spoke about false teachers who would, with their false doctrine, they would uh, merchandise people along with Second Peter. Uh, they would merchandise people who would basically preach grace as a license to sin. That's what it says in Jude, uh, I believe it's verse four, that men would come along and preach grace as a license to sin. So, of course, that would go against his theology. And, of course, Revelation, um, I mean, we have, if we just look all throughout Revelation chapters two and three, we can see why he didn't like these books. And, and he said that really John and Romans were the, were the, uh, the best books that, that really share the gospel, so to speak. And he said, these are what we really need to focus on, John and Romans. And that's a lot of what most pastors do today. They focus on John and Romans. But even John, if we just look at John, uh, in John 15, 6, Jesus warned that if anyone does not abide in him, if anyone does not abide in Jesus, he warned his 11 disciples minus Judas. He was warning them that if they did not abide or remain in him, that they were like a branch that would be thrown away and would wither. And these branches would be gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. So, um, so this is why. And I mean, if we just look, if we just look at Revelation chapters two and three, we see Jesus over and over again, because Martin Luther taught that, that uh, God can't see your sin, okay? So like once, once you accept Jesus, Jesus kind of stands before you, and when God looks at you, he only sees Jesus, and he can't see your sin. And this is clearly refuted in Revelation 2 and 3. If, if we just look at how he addresses the seven churches really quick. Uh, Revelation 2, 5 through 7, he, said, he, told, he tells the church of Ephesus to remember, therefore, from where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he clearly saw their works there. And he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He tells the church of Smyrna, okay, as, as you're listening to this, just tell me if, if this screams eternal security to you, or if it screams that, hey, we need to remain faithful. He tells the church of Smyrna, he says, uh, he tells them to be faithful unto death, and he will give them the crown of life. And, uh, and he tells, that, tells them that the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is a salvation issue, he tells them. Uh, church of Pergamum, they held to the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, and he told them to repent, or he would come soon and war against them with the sword of his mouth. He's talking to Christians here, the church, that he was going to war against them. This doesn't sound like he, he just can't see their sin. Uh, and then church of Thyatira, uh, he said that he would cast Jezebel onto a sickbed and kill her children if she didn't repent. Um, and he says, only hold fast to what you have until I come. So he's telling Christians, hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And then church of Sardis, uh, he says that there were some who had soiled their garments and the ones who hadn't would be worthy, and that uh, that they that he would not blot their name out of his book, and that he would confess their name before the Father and the angels, and then uh, Revelation or Church of Philadelphia. He says, "I'm coming soon. Hold again, hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown." And then, lastly, of course, I already mentioned the Church of Laodicea. 
uh, they were lukewarm and he said that he was going to spit them out of his mouth. And he told them to be zealous and repent. So this is why he, he, he didn't really like these books. He wanted to kind of put them as an appendix at the end. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of information now, but we hear a lot of people counter and say, but the gift of salvation is a gift. Why would God take the gift back? So is it that God takes the gift back or is it that we give the gift? Back? Well, we, well, we have to, yes, it's a gift in the sense that we don't have to do anything to earn it. Okay. He, he gives it to us as a free gift. So if we just look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, uh, we're saved by grace through faith. And it's not of ourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not something that we did. It's not like we, we just did so many things and, and God felt that we earned our salvation and gave us salvation. No, we're saved uh, by, by grace through faith, right? But if you just look at verse 10, he says, uh, it goes on to say that we were saved for a reason. Okay, what was that reason? The whole reason we were saved is to do good works that we should walk in them. That's what Paul says. So that was the entire reason we were saved. And yes, we're saved uh, not as a result of works, but when, when we come into the faith, we absolutely have to maintain, a, it's just like any relationship. We have to maintain a relationship with God. And we can't, like it says in Hebrews, we can't neglect such a great salvation, as it says. And I mean, if you just look at Matthew 18, okay, in the same book where Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother, then your heavenly father won't forgive you. Okay, the same book, if we skip forward to chapter 18, we see that Jesus tells us a parable of the unforgiving servant, okay? He, he had all this debt. This, this servant had all this debt, right? And there's no way he could have paid it. I think if you look it up, it, it was something like $2 million in today's money. He had all this debt. There's no way he could have paid, right? So the master had mercy on him. And he said, okay, you, you can't earn your way out of this. I'm going to have mercy on you. I'm going to forgive all your debt, okay? And he was in danger of having his family enslaved and everything. He said, okay, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to give you mercy. But then he turns around and doesn't give mercy to a fellow servant. And he, he comes to him and says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt. So how, how could you then go and withhold forgiveness uh, and, and demand that your fellow servant pay you back when I forgave you all of your debt? So that's just like us. Like we've been forgiven. But we have to, we have to then walk in love. We, we have to love our neighbor. We can't go back to our old life. We can't go back into, um, you know, sin and we can't go back into hatred. We have to walk. It's like this daily communing with Jesus, just like any other relationship where we walk daily with him. Now, but then you have other people who counter and they say things like, well, if that's the case, they were never saved to begin with. And that's a huge one right now. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an important thing. I have videos on that as well. Uh, on, they usually go to 1 John 2.19 that say, well, if they went out from us, they were never of us. Also, Matthew 7.21 through 23 uh, that says, where Jesus says, I never knew you. I have videos going through and explaining all that. I'm not going to go through and explain all that here. But I mean, if we just look at the, the parable that I just said about the unforgiving servant, he had been forgiven, right? He'd been forgiven of all of his debt, but he, he said that he would not be forgiven now. All of his debt was actually reinstated because he then failed to forgive his fellow servant. And that was just like me. When I fell into unforgiveness, my debt had been, been reinstated, so to speak. I had lost my standing with Christ. I, 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 came, I came away from him. I was no longer walking with him. And all, all of our debt or all, all of my debt was reinstated. And what eternal security people will try to convince you is that you can have security outside of Jesus. And the only security we have is when we're with Jesus. So uh, like John 10, 28, it says, no man can pluck you out of his hand. Well, yes, that's true. But you have to be with him. You have to be walking with him. And we know from first John, it says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with, with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So if we're walking with him, if we're, if we're in this humble, obedient relationship with him, then, then yes, the blood of Jesus is cleansing us. 
But if we start straying from the path and walking away from him and not walking in his commands, then, then all of our debt can be reinstated, just like the unforgiving servant. And, uh, and just like I said, John 15, 6, these branches were in him. He was telling his true disciples that were, that were in him. He warned them. He said, listen, if, if you don't obey me, you can be cut off, cut off the vine. And that's another thing. When we're put on the vine, th there's kind of, I guess, two stages of salvation. Us being put on the vine is, is, is just, you know, faith. We're, we, we just come to him. It's not that we did anything. But he says that if you love me, you'll keep my command. So in, in order not to be cut off, we have to have this humble submitting relationship to Jesus where we listen to him and walk with him. And, and people say that they, that they were never saved. I mean, there's just, there really are so many. I mean, if you just look at any of the parables, um, I mean, it says that you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? He says, you know, that you're the light of the world. We, we can lose our saltiness. Uh, the five foolish virgins, they were waiting for the master to come. They were waiting for the bridegroom. But the problem was they were foolish. They didn't prepare. And even though they called him Lord, they, they were not prepared. And uh, also the prodigal son. If we just look at the prodigal son, the prodigal son left his father, right? But it says in Luke 15, 24 and 32, that when he came back, that he, when he left, he spiritually died. He spiritually died. And that's just like us. When we leave our father, we spiritually die. But it says that when he came back to his father, that he became alive again, that he became found. So yes, just like the prodigal son, if we stray from our father, we can become spiritually dead and lost even after being alive. It says, if you look at that verse, it says that he became alive again. That means that he was alive at one point. He spiritually died when he left his father and then he came back and became alive again. So would you say that there are some people who really weren't saved to begin with though? They went to altar and said a quick prayer and thought they were saved or didn't take it to heart. So you think there were, there are people who believe they are saved and they are not? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, there, there's people that are just uh, culturally Christian uh, that never have truly repented, don't truly believe the words of Jesus. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's going to be people there that, that Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Um, I mean, we see this all throughout culture. There's really no denying that, the, that there's many people that never knew Jesus. But what I see is Jesus' warnings are directed towards true disciples. He, in his parables again and again, he's directing them towards his servants, you know, those who were actually his servants serving him. And he warns them that even they could be cast into hell. He, he even warns Peter in Luke 12. He warns Peter that even he could be cast into hell. And Paul, if we just look at Paul, Paul even said that he himself could become disqualified and become a reprobate in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. That, that word there, disqualified, means a castaway, a reprobate. That means that you're, that you're cut off from Christ. And we see these warnings, this language all throughout, uh, not to be cut off, um, not to neglect your salvation, uh, not to depart from the faith, to continue in the faith. I mean, if we just look at the word abide to continue, well, you can only abide in something that you're actually in in the first place. And Paul says that, that, uh, that you can receive the grace of God in vain or uh, not and end up not having the grace of God after you've received it. And he said that you can be cut off from Christ in Galatians. Um, so how, how can you be cut off from something that you were never a part of to begin with? And how can you receive the grace of God, but yet never have truly had it to begin with? So. Wow, that's good. Now, here's a question that I've had a few interviews before with a few people who said that they ended up in hell. They died and went to hell and but they were born again Christian, but they came back. Now, people would ask the question, well, how can I be sure of my salvation? Because that's the question that a lot of the commenters were asking after. Well, how can I be certain of my salvation? Now I'm scared. What do I do? How do I make sure that I don't lose my salvation. What answer could you give them? Well, yes, uh, today in the church, we see that 
this is very heavily emphasized that our security is very heavily emphasized in churches. You know, that seems to be the number one focus in most churches. Oh, you have to be sure or you have to be secure. But what I see time and time again in the Bible is, yes, I do see security talked about in the Bible, but what I see more than anything is having fear of the Lord. Okay. The Bible says that without the fear of the Lord, we can't even have mercy. Uh, in Luke, I believe it's 150. It says that uh, mercy is given to those who fear him. And the fear of the Lord, it says in, I think it's Proverbs, it says that this is a fountain of life. Okay. This is something that gives life. This is so crucial. And this is lacking in most churches today and in most denominations today. This lack of the fear of the Lord, this is what we're supposed to have. We're to walk humbly with our God and, and walk in fear. And this keeps us close. This is a good thing. This isn't a bad thing. It says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Okay, this gives life. This is a good thing to, to stay close to him. And, um, but this is what I see, the Bible emphasizing the fear of the Lord. And like I said, in John 10, 28, okay, we, we have security in, in Jesus. He says, no man can pluck you out of my hand, right? Well, but what's he talking about? If we just look at the verse right before it, verse 27, we see that he's talking about the devil, the wolf can't just come and snatch you. And that's, that's really reassuring to know that we can't just be walking with Jesus one day and the next day the devil, devil says, I want that one and just snatch him away and Jesus doesn't do anything about it. No, he's a good shepherd. He'll protect us against the wolves. But if we, like a sheep that goes astray, if we leave him, he says, no one can pluck you out of his hand. But if we walk away, if we leave him, then we open ourselves up to attack, you know, like I did. I opened myself up to demons and attack because I was not close to the shepherd. The shepherd is protecting you while you're walking with him, while you're walking in the light, like John says, uh, then the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. But if you go astray, then you, you have no assurance. And what these eternal security proponents, uh, I, I guess, are trying to suggest is that you can have security in your sin. And the Bible just doesn't offer that. It, it doesn't offer any single bit of assurance in sin. The only assurance that it offers is if you're walking humbly with your God and that you're relying on him and walking in his commands. But so, okay, there are verses that do talk about it though, about assurance. If we just look at Romans, uh, Romans 8, 16 and 17, it says that the spirit bears witness that we're his. So we can know right now whether or not we are abiding in Jesus. Jesus says, you know, abide in me. So we can know because the spirit himself bears witness that we're his children. That's what it says. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs to Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See, we have to continue in the faith. Uh, we have to suffer with him. We have to go through hardships. We have to walk this narrow path. And, but, we, but he says, the spirit does bear witness that we're his, but we have to continue in that. And like Romans, it says in Romans 8.1, that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the, the King James actually goes on to say, for those who walk not according to the flesh, this is what it means to be in Jesus is you're, you're walking with him. You're not walking off away into sin like the prodigal. No, you're walking with him. Yes, there's no condemnation for those who are walking with Jesus. But if you want assurance that there's going to be no condemnation for you while you're not walking with Jesus, then I'm sorry, the Bible just doesn't offer that. And in fact, he goes on to say in Romans 8, 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do what? Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, over and over again, he talks about this walk, this walk. Don't walk according to the flesh. He says, Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. This is talking about spiritual death. But if by the spirit, you put the death of these, the body, you'll live for all who are led by the spirit or spirit of God are the sons of God. So how we know we are in Christ is we're being led by the spirit. That's what he says here. The spirit testifies we're being led, but this is in the context of we're not walking according to the flesh. We're not walking off into sin. Like in Galatians five, it says by this, it is evident, uh, the, the works of the flesh. And it goes on and says things like enmity, strife, uh, jealousy, divisions, uh, sexual immorality, all these things. That's how we know that we're not walking in the spirit. We're walking according to the flesh. And there is, there, there is no protection against condemnation while we're walking in the flesh, while we're straying from our shepherd. Uh, there's only protection while we're with the shepherd. 
And lastly, 1 John 5.13, some people use this and it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And they'll say, see, you can know that you have eternal life just by believing in him. That's it. But he says in the beginning, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. So what are these things? Well, if we just look before that in 1 John chapters 2 and 3, we see what these things he was writing them, what, what the way that we can know we're in Christ and that we're truly born of God. He, he, gives, he gives evidence to know whether or not we're truly born of God and whether or not we're truly Christians. So we have to factor that in. He says, uh, 1 John 2, 3 through 6, and by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So if you want assurance, here's your assurance. But how, how do you know we've come to know him? Because some people say, well, hey, I know Jesus. Well, he says right here, by this, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So that's the evidence. And then 1 John 3, uh, last thing here, it says, little children, let no one deceive you. That means that people are going to be deceiving you out there about this. We need to, we need to be on guard. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil and get this. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Adam, could you explain how one can obtain a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Uh, yeah, uh, so if we just look in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about how the Israelites were being led out of Egypt, right? And, and he says that this is a comparison of us today, right? So if we just look back, this is where we get uh, the Passover from, the, the Israelites being led out, what happened was they, uh, they had to sacrifice a sheep, put the blood over the doorpost so the angel of death doesn't, uh, didn't take their firstborn, right? Well, this is a picture of Jesus's blood, right? The, he, he's our, he's our uh, lamb that's been sacrificed. And a lot of people will stop there though. And they'll say, hey, the blood's been put over the door. Nothing more needs to be done. You know, that's it. We're saved. Uh, we're saved. It's a done deal. But if you just look at the Israelites and this analogy that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 10, that was not the end of the road, so to speak. That was actually just the beginning. Like I said earlier, we, we come into a relationship with, with faith. It's, it's the blood of Jesus from start to finish. Okay, but there's more to it than just, you know, the Israelites, they put the blood over the doorpost. There's more to it. That, yes, that's the beginning. But then they had to walk. They had to walk out of Egypt, and then Egypt started coming after them. And it's just like our sins, the devil's going to come after us. Our sins are going to come after us and try to bring us back into slavery, right? But like it says in 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2, if we go back to our sin after being freed by the knowledge of the truth, then that state is actually worse for us than the first. It would have been better not to even know Jesus, it says, than to go back to our sin. So they then had to walk to the waters of baptism. And that's just like us. He, Paul uses this analogy that the Red Sea was like them being baptized. They went down into the water and they were baptized. And he says uh, that this was a picture of baptism in a sense. But then that still wasn't the end of the road because they then had to continue to walk all the way to the promised land. And, and that's just like us. We have to then walk in the spirit. We have to then abide in Jesus and and be led by the spirit, be led by, uh, you know, the, the scripture and, and continue to walk with Jesus all the way to the end. And what did Paul warn them in first Corinthians 10? He, he warned them. He said, do not become idolaters like them did. And they were destroyed. Do not commit sexual morality like they did and were destroyed by the serpents. 
So we have to continue to look to Jesus. We have to continue to be obedient, remain faithful, uh, just like he talks about in Revelation chapters two and three, and, and have this daily communion, you know, just like we take communion, that's to, you know, that's a picture of us being in communion with, with Jesus. Well, we have to be in communion. We have to remain in the spirit and walk with him all the way. And that's why Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, see, we got repentance, it's faith, uh, repentance, then baptism, and then we're walking with the Holy Spirit all the way. We, we haven't gotten there yet, okay? We haven't, gotten to the, we, we haven't gotten to the promised land yet. We're still walking with Jesus, and there's so many warnings all throughout Scripture that we can be cut off and not endured at the end. Um, and it says in Luke 9.23, okay? See, it's the cross all the way through. Don't, don't let there be no mistake. It's the blood of Jesus all the way through. But, you know, if, if I had maybe just one second to share the gospel with somebody, I might just say Jesus. And that's it. Like if I just had one second. But like Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that the, the gospel was, um, was Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, right? But there's more to it than that. That we, we're, we're buried uh, into Jesus. We're buried into Jesus' death in our baptism. That's where we're united with Jesus. And, uh, and then we, we receive the Holy Spirit and we have to continue to walk in the spirit. And listen to this. He says that now I would remind you brothers of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If here's that condition, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, we, we have to continue to hold fast to the gospel. And uh, Colossians 1, 22 and 23 says he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So we have to continue to hold fast to the word. So it's so it's the gospel all the way through. It's, it's the cross. It's the blood of Jesus. But Jesus said that we have to then take up our own cross, right? He said in Luke 9, 23, if, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his own cross daily and follow me. So, so, that's, so that's a picture of, of us just like that, just like Jesus died on the cross. We have to head towards the cross as well. We have to take up our own cross, die to ourself, die to sin, die to the flesh, and uh take up our crosses daily and follow him. Wow. Wow. This is some good stuff, Adam. So you talk a lot about this on your channel, which is called Epicion Apologetics. First Epi of all, yeah. Epicion. Did it's I say it's hard to say. Uh, so so Epicion Apologetics. Epicion yeah, it, Apologetics. It takes now, quite a, quite a lot of times to saying it. Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean? Well, it means, so in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, the word daily there is actually epiusion. And when they were translating it, they didn't really know what it meant. So they kind of just had to guess. It was, it's one of, I think there's 50 words in the New Testament where they don't, where they didn't really know because it's a brand new word. It, it, they can't find it in other literature, other Greek literature at the time. So they kind of just had to look at the context and guess. But if you just look at it, it doesn't make sense that it was daily bread, right? Because it says, give us this day our daily bread. It's kind of redundant. So doing some research on it, I found that a more accurate um, explanation of it, it looks like it's actually a conglomerate word of epi, which means above, and eusia, which means substance. So the actual translation of what it means more accurately might be supernatural. So in the Lord's Prayer, uh, it really probably should read, give us this day our supernatural bread, which is Jesus. He, he said that he's the bread of life in John 6, that, that he's the true spiritual bread. So every day, that, that's, that's kind of like this whole concept I was talking about of every day we're abiding in him, we're walking with him, and, and he's our supernatural bread, the bread that comes down from heaven. We need to abide in him every day. Amen. So tell us more about your channel, because your channel is an apologetics channel, which I believe every Christian should know how to do or should know a lot about apologetics. So could you just tell us about your channel? 
Yeah. So, uh, so I actually started this channel. Uh, I, I was praying for God to just let me be fruitful. I just wanted to be as fruitful as possible. And, uh, and God granted me to start this channel because what happened was I couldn't find anybody really preaching this, preaching what I preach, just the, just the words of the Bible here uh, without twisting them or anything like that. So at the time I could only find like a handful of channels. I mean, since then I've found some others, but, but there's not many that are preaching this. Uh, most of them are eternal security um, and that sort of thing, but, but I, I couldn't find any. So I prayed and God let me start this channel to, like I said, warn people uh, that no, you, you can be cut off. You can be cut off from the vine. Um, so that's, so I talk a lot about eternal security on my channel. I talk about other things too, but yes, it's an apologetics channel, but in the sense of apologetics directed towards Christians more so than anything. Um, and, and I may go into other religions too, but the, my main focus, what I believe that God has called me to is to bring back the lost sheep. Okay. And in James 5, 19 and 20, it says, if a brother wanders from the truth, you know, wanders off into sin, let him know that whoever brings back his soul from death, or, or, or brings him back from his wondering saves his soul from death. So that's that's pretty much where my channel is directed, bringing back the uh, the lost sheep back to the father, those who have strayed off into sin, bringing back the prodigals. Um, so, but the what's standing in the way is a lot of false doctrine, like eternal security, uh, like all these new doctrines that came about, like I said, just within the past few hundred years. We got people like Joseph Smith coming along and, and saying, hey, you know, all the churches are wrong. Uh, and, and he said that, no, no, you, you have to follow me now. And he started the Mormon church. And it's like, you, you, would, you would think, who would believe this? Okay, some guy comes along in the 1800s and says, no, no, how they've been doing the past 1800 years, that's not correct. No, you got to listen to me. You would think people would be like, what, who, who are you? And why, why would you follow this? But look at how many Mormons there are, the same with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, there's Charles Taze Russell that came along and said, you know, no, I have the truth. And there's all these different people, John, John Calvin, no, I have the truth. And you have to subscribe to, to Calvinism. He, you know, it wasn't called Calvinism back then, but, uh, you know, to, to my doctrine, doctrines of grace. And there's so many people that have just come along and began to lead the sheep astray. And this was prophesied. Jesus said that, you know, there'd be times of great difficulty as it got closer to the last days, and there would be many false uh, or wolves that would lead the sheep astray, and that's what we're that's what we're entering into. Just there's so much, so many false teachers out there. That's why over and over again we're called to be on guard. That, that's a command to watch out for false teachers, to make sure that we're looking at the Bible and and comparing all this that we're being taught with Scripture. And uh, you know, I, I've given so many scriptures. I I hope and I pray that you guys just look over these and, and judge for yourself and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Don't, don't just look to men and say, well, you know, Martin Luther believed this and he seemed, uh, you know, okay, seemed pretty smart. Or my pastor believes this and he seems pretty smart and like a good guy. So I'm just going to believe him. No, we, we need to let the Holy Spirit guide us. We need to um, look, like I said, the, the early Christians, none of them believe this, none of them. And so that should tell you that something's up right there. Actually, the only ones that did believe it weren't really Christians. They were called the Gnostics. And these were those who were being fought against so hard. Uh, First John was written against the Gnostics. Um, but they, they believe that, yeah, eternal security is true. And that sin didn't affect your salvation at all. And this is unfortunately what many Christians are, are falling prey to today. This is why I truly believe that every single Christian needs to read their Bible, because the Holy Spirit will interpret it for them. And the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself, doesn't, doesn't contradict himself, I'm sorry. So um, Adam, I would love for you to pray for our viewers to have revelation knowledge, because this is a lot of knowledge that you put out today, scripturally. And a lot of people have been deceived to believe certain things um, through the pulpit or, or through other people. But we need to know what the Lord is saying. And we know he speaks so much through his word. So could you just pray for our viewers to have revelation knowledge? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just we just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to let the light shine forward and just the, the truth be made manifest. Um, Lord, we, we just seek you above all else. We just seek the truth. Uh, we just seek you. Uh, Lord, let 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 every every doctrine and, and all that that's not of you uh, just reveal that to us. Just reveal to us your heart. Reveal to us that uh, that, that that we must stick with you and that we must walk with you. Just Lord, please show us that. Please teach us how to love you in the way that that you would want to be loved, Father. There, there's a lot of talk about uh, your love for us, and your love is is so unimaginable. And I know that your mercy uh, on me has been just just unbelievable, Lord. Uh, but Lord, we, we need to be doers of the word. So help us to, to be doers of the word. Help us and, and help us to just see through all the clutter and all the, all the different teachings out there. And let us just see you, Father. Let us just, uh, let us just be brought into the light and, and come to the revelation of who you are and what your will is for us. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you so much for this interview. Hey, thank you for having me. And uh, anybody out there, uh, just check out my channel. I have, like I said, many videos on what the early Christians believed about eternal security. Um, I have uh, videos that list over 40 people in the New Testament alone uh, who lost their salvation. So check that out as well. Uh, I have a video on exactly when you lose your salvation, if you want to know more about that, and so many other topics on eternal security and once saved, always saved. So uh, please check that out, and God bless everybody.